Welcome everyone, bienvenue to the our AFUSA author talk featuring Professor Jeffrey H. Ja Jeffrey H. Jackson, Professor of History at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. He's gonna speak about his new book, Paper Bullets, Two Artists Who Risked Their Lives to Defy the Nazis. My name is Renee Ketchum, and I'm honored as a member of the Cultural Offering Selection Committee to introduce Professor Jackson and his book that was awarded the 2021 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction and selected as an editor's choice best of the best for the 2020 for 2020 by book list. So just a little housekeeping, please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. Keep your options set to speaker, not gallery. And then we'll enable the chat during the question and answer period. So don't raise your hand, don't unmute yourself. Um, there's gonna be plenty of time for questions at the end and the program will last an hour. So again, we'll have probably 40 minutes of conversation um, with Professor Jackson and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So a few words about this book, which I absolutely loved, read cover to cover. Um, in this riveting new historical vision, of an audacious anti-Nazi campaign brilliantly organized to ultimately demoralize Nazi troops, Paper Bullets provides a gender-bending narrative highlighting the resistance, brilliance of Lucienne Suzanne, AKA Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore, a new breed of France Tireurs, those are guerrilla warfarers, they could act guerrilla warriors, I should say using spiritual arms instead of firearms, manipulating propaganda, taking on the identity of, entre guillemets, the soldier with no name, to demoralize the Nazi occupiers of Jersey, a German stronghold from 1940 to 1945 in the Channel Islands during World War II, a place that I can't wait to visit at this point in time. Through their work and their concept of indirect action and cutting edge psychological warfare, they created paper bullets that like the surrealistic world that they participated in in Paris before their move to Jersey were designed to change people and make them see the world very, very differently. Professor Jackson has broken audacious new ground in this must read on the impact of women in wartime. Perhaps similar, and I always like to have some fun facts as I introduce our guests, perhaps similar to the impact that he must have had on his wife when he proposed to her in the Paris sewers on a self-guided tour. So it's my great honor to introduce Professor Jeffrey H. Jackson. Je vous donne la parole. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and I just wanna thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was so uh, generous, uh, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining me uh, to hear more about Paper Bullets. I'm coming to you live from my home in Memphis. Uh, I wish we could all be in person together, but thanks to the magic of the internet, many more of you can, uh, I think, join in today than maybe under normal circumstances. So I appreciate you taking the time uh, to tune in. Um, it's really a great honor to be part of an event organized by the Fédération des Alliances Françaises. I've worked with our local Alliance Française de Memphis. Uh, on several events over the years, and some of them may be uh, watching today, may have tuned in today. Um, and so I'm very glad to be able to speak to members of the Alliance Francaise and also the American Association of Teachers of French uh, and any others who are tuning in from all across the country this afternoon. Um, some of you may be familiar with my earlier work, which is focused on France and French history and French culture. I wrote a book about the disastrous, but sometimes forgotten Paris flood of 1910 that appeared for the 100th anniversary of that event in 2010, titled Paris Underwater. Um, and my first book, Making Jazz French, about the reception of jazz music in Paris in the 1920s and the 1930s, and how jazz became part of the, the regular part of the French cultural scene. Um, but for the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna tell you a powerful story about resistance and perseverance in the face of grave danger by two French artists that forms the heart of Paper Bullets. And I'll also read some selected excerpts from the book, just to give you a sense of how I tell the story and to give you some uh, of the great detail that I uncovered in my research. Um, I've lightly edited each of the excerpts that I'll read today just for clarity's sake. Um, and I'll be happy to answer some of the questions um, that you post in the chat according to the instructions that, that we've heard. Um, we won't be able to get to all the questions, uh, I'm afraid, but we'll certainly try to answer as many as we can. Uh, and we'll end after about an hour. So I'm going to um, share my screen with you.
and I hope everyone can uh, can see that okay. If not, somebody uh, let me know. <laughs> um, and I want to say I want to start by saying a special thanks to my friends at Novel, um, which is a wonderful local bookstore here in Memphis. Novel is selling signed copies of Paper Bullets, and if you're interested, you can order uh, one through their website, NovelMemphis.com, or you can call them on the phone uh, and request a signed copy. And I'm also happy to personalize. Uh, when I sign. So you can just make a note in the comments section when you check out uh, or talk to the person on the phone about how you'd like the inscription to be personalized and they'll ship it to you. Um, of course, you can order the book from many places, both in person and online, including Apple Books, where it was named a best book for November 2020 when it first launched. But it's so great to be able to help support a local independent bookseller here in Memphis uh, or wherever you live. Well, let me start then by introducing you to the two remarkable women that are at the heart of this book. Um, if you know something about art and especially the history of photography, you may have heard of them before. Um, but even if you know their work, you may not know much about the story of how and why they fought the Nazis for four years. But their story has really inspired me and many others that I've told it to. And so I'm very glad to be able to share it with you today. So I'd like you to meet Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Maler, two of the most unlikely Nazi fighters that most of you have probably never heard of. They were Parisian artists. Lucy was a writer. Suzanne was an illustrator who had studied in art school when she was young. Together, the two of them collaborated on what people in their own day saw as some shocking, uh, some sometimes shocking photographs. They, they were friends with and influenced by many of the great modern artists in Paris of their day, Picasso, André Breton, Salvador Dali, Jean Cocteau, but their images turned ideas of gender and identity on their heads. More than anything, that's what they're known for today. And if you do know them, you know them by a couple of different names. And I'm gonna say more about their names uh, in just a minute. But after they left Paris and left the art world behind, they put their skills as artists to work fighting against the German army on the island of Jersey, one of the British Channel Islands. They used their creative powers to get inside the heads of soldiers. In brief, here's how it worked. Lucy and Suzanne created a PSYOPs campaign, a psychological operations campaign that was designed to demoralize the soldiers, telling them that the war was a lost cause and trying to convince them to go home to their families. And they did it in a very unexpected way with notes and messages and summaries of BBC news reports, drawings, songs, body jokes, provocative slogan, slogans, all written or typed on little slips of paper like the one that you see on your screen. And they left these around the island for the Germans to find. In some cases, they even put some of their notes directly into the pockets of soldiers themselves. And now I want to read an excerpt from the book. This is the opening scene um, that gives you a sense of their project and how they went about it. On the morning of July 25th, 1944, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Maller went into saint Helier to do some shopping. The trip was part of their regular routine. Outside the offices of the Jersey Evening Post, they glanced up at the large clock at the top of the building. Suzanne leaned in and whispered to Lucy to keep watch. Then Suzanne scanned the long row of police cars the Nazi occupation forces always parked along Charles Street, a reminder of how heavily the Germans censored the island's only newspaper. Suzanne took a small piece of paper out of her pocket and began moving carefully toward one of the police cars as Lucy stood by on lookout duty. Suzanne stuck the gummed paper on the windshield. It read, the cowardly bureaucrats of the police who live on lies and shameful cruelty will be destroyed by the soldiers with no names. No one seemed to be paying any attention to the middle-aged women in Burberry trench coats with bright scarves tied around their heads. Suzanne quickly attached papers to a few more windshields and casually strolled away, her Wellington boots thumping on the pavement. If anyone asked the women what they were doing, their shopping bag would provide a ready alibi. After finishing their secret mission, along with some mundane errands, they met up with their housekeeper, Edna, and boarded one of the wood-burning buses to head back home on the other side of the island. Lucy held a package of cigarette papers they had just bought at the newsstand. These papers were destined to become a new batch of notes for the Nazis. In her pocket, alongside more of their notes, Suzanne could feel the bright blue milk of magnesia bottle. It did not contain the digestive medicine, however, but instead an overdose of the powerful barbiturate Gardenol in case the Germans caught them in the act. With no warning, the bus came to an abrupt halt and a fair-haired soldier climbed aboard. Everyone off the bus. Lucy clutched her parcel a bit tighter. 
Outside, the soldier approached each commuter. Suzanne noticed his bright blue eyes. Please show me your papers. How old are you? What is your occupation? Where were you born? Where do you live? How many children do you have? With his critical eye, the German carefully looked over each passenger's documents until satisfied, saying very little other than what was necessary to get his answers. If something was suspicious or if passengers had forgotten their documents, they were told someone will visit you in your home. Then the soldier approached Lucy and Suzanne. Lucy recalled the scene several years later in a scrapbook of notes that might have formed the basis of a memoir if she had lived long enough. She titled these reminiscences, The Mute in the Middle of the Muddle. Show me your registration card, the German demanded. He stood in front of Lucy, glaring at her. A look of recognition crossed his face when he saw a familiar name, Schwab. What kind of name is that? The document listed French as her national origin. She explained nervously that she was an orphan and raised by a Frenchman. Perhaps you are Alsatian. Maybe, she replied, but admitted that she didn't really know. Lucy stated that she had been on Jersey for some 30 years. Nearly everything she had just told the German about herself was a calculated lie. She invented a new backstory for herself and not for the first time. As the minutes ticked by, Lucy waited patiently next to the bus and watched the soldier scrutinize her documents. Suzanne and Edna were close by but could do nothing to help. Lucy, perhaps coughing or stumbling a bit, played sick for the German's benefit, brushing off her acting skills from her Paris days when she took part in avant-garde theater productions. Finally, the soldier handed back Lucy's papers. When he wrapped up his examination of all the passengers, everyone reboarded the bus. An acquaintance riding with them tried to break the nervous tension created by the ordeal. They have not caught you this time, she said, laughing, unaware of what Lucy's parcel of cigarette papers was destined for. Now I'll tell you more about how they did all of this in just a moment, but first I wanna tell you a little bit about their background because one of the things that I had to think about as I was researching and writing this book was why would two women with so much to lose put their lives on the line in the way that they did? And I also had to think a lot about what it was about who they were that gave them the strength and the power to become resistors because after all, most people did not become resistors during World War II. Part of the answer to those questions I think lies in their personal histories. Lucy and Suzanne grew up around the turn of the 20th century in the southern French city of Nantes uh, as daughters of wealth and privilege. Lucy's father was a newspaper owner and editor, and Suzanne's was the head of the medical school and a well-known physician. They were never starving artists, even when they moved to Paris as young women in their 20s just after World War I to pursue their artistic careers because they always had family resources. One reason they did not become famous in their day, even in the art world, is that they never really needed to publicize their work in order to make money. Now, they were known in certain circles, such as among the surrealists with whom they were friends, but for decades, they were largely forgotten until being rediscovered in the 1980s. Yet to become resistors, they would need to give up the privilege and the comfort that they had been born with. But why would they? Well, I think there were some key things about their life stories, which although they didn't know it at the time, would set the stage for their resistance against the Nazis. First of all, Lucy's father's family was Jewish. Although he was assimilated and didn't practice the faith, Lucy embraced elements of her Jewish identity that were taught to her by her grandmother. There were also several rabbis and scholars of Jewish life in the family. Lucy was four years old at the height of one of the worst anti-Semitic episodes in modern French history, the Dreyfus Affair. Now, that's a complicated story. We don't have time to go into it here today but it certainly led to crowds outside the family's apartment shouting down with the Jews. Later, when Lucy was 12, she was attacked by other children in school who pelted her with rocks and anti-Semitic taunts while she lay helpless on the ground. Lucy and Suzanne both would remember those horrible days and the memory would fuel their hatred of fascism and their willingness to fight it. A second factor that allowed them to become resistors was the fact that they were in love. Lucy and Suzanne had met as young girls in the elite circles of Nantes society and played together from childhood. By the time they were teenagers, they began a relationship that was in tension with a conservative French Catholic society that valued respectability. Most people in France at the turn of the century did not see a lesbian couple as respectable. Their connection was made even more complicated by the fact that in 1917, Lucy's divorced father married Suzanne's widowed mother, making the girls stepsisters but their feelings were powerful. 
Lucy wrote in a thinly veiled article published in a Nantes-based literary journal that her feelings for Suzanne were her idée maîtresse, her guiding idea, and her, uh, her main idea, and her guiding principle. Uh, she wrote, I am in her, she is in me, and I will follow her always, never losing sight of her. And if you see in this image here on your screen on the right-hand side, you see a drawing that Lucy did, um, and you see at the top their initials, LS and SM, Lucy Schwab, Suzanne Malherbe, and they've all been run together, LSM, uh, behind this drawing. Um, and when you pronounce those three letters phonetically in French, you get LSM, which is translated uh, means they love each other. Drawing on their own experiences, Lucy and Suzanne also explore gender and sexuality as fluid and changing categories. Now, this is one of the things that they're most famous for today. In fact, uh, as I said before, they're, they're not known in the art world as Lucy and Suzanne, but rather by the gender neutral artistic names, which they took, uh, Claude Caen and Marcel Moore. Uh, Claude Caen, I've heard it pronounced multiple different ways, often in English and especially American speakers tend to say Cahoon. Um, I'll probably flip back and forth between multiple pronunci <laughs> pronunciations because uh, I say it so many different ways in different contexts. But Claude Caen, Marcel Moore, um, they assume these names to create new identities and also to cross gender lines. Claude in particular is a name that's used by both men and women in French. Cahoon put it this way in a memoir that she published in 1930. She wrote, masculine, feminine, it depends on the situation. Neuter is the only gender that always suits me. If it existed in our language, no one would be able to see my thoughts vacillation. Gender was for her situational, conditional, fluid, depending on the moment. Lucy's new name also allowed her to express her Jewishness. It was as much about her Jewishness as it was about gender because uh, Caen was the name of one set of Lucy's grandparents, in particular, the grandmother who had taught her about Judaism. Caen is also the French version of Cohen, the Hebrew word for priest. So like many other artists of their day, they created work under new names, but these identities also allowed the women to slip the trap of traditional bourgeois society. Yet throughout their lives, they always still called one another Lucy and Suzanne. Um, we tend to call them Claude Cahoon, Marcel Moore, uh, because we know them through their art. Uh, but the historical record is much more complicated, and I can talk more about this later on. But it's very clear that in the historical documents that they always refer to one another as Lucy and Suzanne. Um, and depending on the context, they use different names in, in different moments. Lucy and Suzanne are the names on their tombstone. Now, if you have seen their work under the names Claude Cahoon, Marcel Moore, then you know of the ways in which their photographs depict Claude Cahan in gender ambiguous dress or pose, playing with notions of masculinity and femininity, in some ways helping to invent the notion of what we would now call queerness long before our current understanding of that idea was created. In fact, many queer and transgender people today see them as early heroes and role models. Their photos deconstructed gender categories, showing them to be masquerade and performance decades before scholars would take up these questions. Uh, Cahan put it in this way in her autobiography. She wrote, I shave my head, wrench out my teeth, my breasts, anything that is embarrassing or annoying to look at, stomach, ovaries, the brain, conscious and covered in cysts, suggesting that alter altering gender and sexual identity was part of the goal and so was creating a new self. Musician David Bowie, well known for his own gender ambiguity, mentioned a 2007 show of Cahoon and Moore's photography on his blog. He wrote, I find this work really quite mad in the nicest way. And that ability to cross gender lines would also become crucial, crucial to Lucy and Suzanne's fight against the Nazis. Lucy and Suzanne spent the 1920s and most of the 1930s in Paris, but they decamped to the island of Jersey uh, in 1937 when they were both in their late 40s. They had vacation on Jersey many times over the years, so its beaches and natural beauty were familiar to them. And I'll just say on a personal note, I visited uh, the island of Jersey um, when I was doing research for this project and I can completely understand why they wanted to go there. It's a beautiful place uh, and I had a wonderful visit there. Um, Jersey was also a perfect respite for Lucy's chronically ill health. She had a number of medical conditions through which Suzanne had helped to nurse her over the years. And Paris had become deeply politically polarized by the 1930s with various groups literally fighting in the streets and with fascism on the rise across Europe, Jersey offered a peaceful escape. 
When they left Paris and they left the art world behind, they stopped using the names Claude Cahan and Marcel Moore and returned almost exclusively to their birth names, Lucy and Suzanne. That's part of why I refer to them uh, in the book as Lucy and Suzanne is because mostly I'm dealing with their post-Paris lives. Little did they know though, that when they moved to Jersey, they were stepping into what would soon become a war zone. When the fighting broke out in Poland in 1939, Jersey seemed far away from the action. But by 1940, the Channel Islands would become the front lines. The islands were the only piece of British soil the Nazis conquered, and they were crucial to what Hitler called his Atlantic Wall, a line of defense in the West designed to keep the Allies at bay. Thousands of German troops soon arrived in Lucy and Suzanne's adopted home to build fortifications, which would be used to protect the continent from Allied assault. It was so important that Hitler personally received regular updates from the islands. No dissent could be tolerated in such a strategically important location. But dissent is exactly what Lucy and Suzanne did. Back in Paris, they had been involved in left-wing politics, befriending communists and other radicals. They had signed petitions and open letters against the rise of fascism and protesting anti-immigrant legislation. Lucy had written a letter to a magazine supporting gay rights. So by the time they arrived on Jersey, they had been rebels for some time. Add to that their own lives as lesbian partners lived in opposition to the mores of their day and their provocative artwork that challenged notions of beauty and gender identity. Ultimately, all of the strands of their lives came together to not only give them the strength to resist the German occupation of Jersey, but to give them the skills to do so. They put their creative talents, their political inclinations, and their personal backgrounds into their work, and it gave them the tools to fight back. Resistance was not an afterthought, but the peak and the point of their creative lives. Most importantly, their love kept them going as they supported one another through what were some very scary and very stressful moments. I really don't believe that either woman alone could have done this work. I think that just like their art, their resistance was something that came out of their relationship and their love. Now, as I said before, their desire to resist led them to write notes to the Nazis, something that on the face of it seems small and even inconsequential. But the notes they wrote were powerful indeed. All of these messages were designed to demoralize the troops or to convince them to desert or mutiny or go back to their families in Germany. And the German army took them very seriously. For four years, the secret field police, which was tasked with keeping order in occupied territory, tracked them, trying to find out who was leaving all of these notes around the island. Sometimes the agents would find them on fence posts, sometimes on cafe tables, sometimes tucked into magazines and the newsstands, sometimes placed inside the German staff cars parked along the streets and sometimes in their own pockets. The women even hung a sarcastic banner over the altar at the church near their house where some of the soldiers worshiped reading, Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater because Jesus died for people, but people die for Hitler. What they were doing with all of these messages was scaring the German command into believing that a conspiracy was afoot on the island, this strategically important zone about which Hitler received regular updates. Was there someone on the island threatening the Atlantic wall that protected Hitler's conquered continent from allied attack? The notes only served to stoke the Germans' paranoia. And now I'd like to read a second excerpt from the book. This is the scene in the book where they are arrested. During a quiet dinner, a fist pounded at the door. It was the moment Lucy and Suzanne had been expecting every day for nearly four years. The only question was whether the Germans were clever enough to have discovered the women on their own or if someone had ratted them out. Suzanne got up from the table, walked to the door and pulled it open. Having studied these men carefully from afar for a long time, Lucy and Suzanne knew that they would not be smiling. Five men stood on their doorstep, including the chief of the secret field police, Captain Boda, uh, and a fair-haired man with bright blue eyes who wore mustard-colored plus fours. Suzanne greeted them with a simple good evening. With a surprising graciousness, the fair-haired man clicked his heels and made a deep, respectful bow from the hips. German secret police, Suzanne remembered him announcing politely, we come to search your house. Boda strode to the window seat and made himself comfortable, perhaps puffing on his cigar, while the fair-haired man, whom the others called Carl, started to run excitedly back and forth throughout the house. They ransacked every corner, pulling out all the drawers, prying into every nook and cranny of Lucy and Suzanne's lives. From his perch, Boda watched with suspicion as the two tired women, their faces slightly wrinkled and hair graying, stood by. Too late, Lucy announced in English, 
knowing that these men did not speak French and herself unable to speak much German. Germany has already lost the war, she proclaimed. Lucy and Suzanne remained calm, but their maid Edna panicked as the men ravaged the house. She knew everyone in the household had been breaking German regulations by hoarding food. Perhaps she worried that she had let something slip about the illegal radio. Carl came over to Lucy and stared down at her. And what do you think will happen to you? You tell me that, he shouted, his calm and polite demeanor at the door now gone as the adrenaline from the thrill of the chase pumped through him. I think that probably you will torture us and shoot us afterward, Lucy replied flatly, as though she had always known and accepted that this would be the outcome. Carl was stunned silent. These women were not hysterical or even surprised by a raid on their house, but were already anticipating their own deaths. I believe until that moment, he had thought us unaware of the risks we had been taking, Suzanne reflected. Carl looked at Boda, then back at Lucy and Suzanne. But we never do that kind of thing, he proclaimed indignantly. That is BBC propaganda. Lucy glanced back at him, raising her eyebrow in disbelief. Now the notes that frightened the Germans the most were the ones that Lucy and Suzanne signed, but they didn't sign them with their own name. Rather, they used the name of an author that they had invented. They created a fictional persona and pretended to write messages from that perspective in German, since Suzanne was fluent. But the persona was significant. They called him the soldier with no name. In other words, they crossed gender lines once again, this time in effect becoming a German soldier. When they wrote notes in this male German voice aimed at the other soldiers, they made the secret police believe that the threat was coming from within the German army itself. This was one of their innovations. Note writing was not unique to them. There are many cases of people living in German occupied territory and even within Nazi Germany itself, writing notes as a form of dissent. But most of those notes were aimed at the civilian population, reminding them to keep their spirits up or calling on them to resist the Nazis. As far as I can tell, Lucy and Suzanne were unique as civilians aiming their notes at the German soldiers themselves. The only real parallel was the Allied PSYOPs campaign, which dropped German language leaflets behind enemy lines, encouraging soldiers to desert or to surrender. What Lucy and Suzanne were doing here was rewriting the inner script or what the political theorist James C. Scott calls the hidden transcript that the Germans told themselves about how the war was going. They were getting inside the minds of the soldiers and sowing seeds of doubt and dissension spreading ideas that they hoped would go viral, so to speak, among the troops. Somebody I was talking with not too long ago uh, actually likened them to internet memes. If a German uh, soldier read their notes, signed by the soldier with no name, and believed that they really were written by a comrade, Lucy and Suzanne hoped he might think twice about what he was doing on Jersey. Maybe he would even mutiny or desert. Now, of course, I don't have time to tell you the whole story today, but suffice it to say that they were indeed arrested by the secret field police, as we heard in the last excerpt. They were interrogated. They were put on trial on November 16th, 1944, just over 76 years ago. And then they were sent to prison and sentenced to death. And so I wanna read a third excerpt for you. This is the scene where they are uh, on trial. The judges and lawyers convened in large imitation leather armchairs on one side of the table. Lucy and Suzanne's chairs placed opposite the Germans were so large that the women could not use the armrests without spreading themselves unnaturally wide. So Suzanne rested her hands in her lap. Lucy, thinned by illness and lack of nourishment, was curled up in one corner of her chair like a child who climbed in a seat made for a large adult. Behind them were two rows of spindly gilt cane chairs Captain Bodo, wearing a white jacket and smoking his cigar, balanced on one of them. On a table lay all the items confiscated during the raid, including their Phillips radio, their Underwood typewriter and Kodak camera, two guns, books, articles published by Lucy's father, one of Suzanne's wooden crosses that Lucy had planted on a soldier's fresh grave, pieces of fabric, and a few of the coins on which the women had painted down with war with nail polish. These once familiar things now seemed strange, so out of context in a courtroom rather than at home. This collection looks like a sort of junk shop, Lucy Riley thought. Also on the table sat Boda's fat file, which was packed with their notes. The approximately 300 scraps of paper now entered into evidence were only a fraction of what they had produced, 1 20th, Lucy claimed. Her estimate was different from what Suzanne recalled, but of course neither had really been counting. 
The other noteworthy feature in the room was the three quarter length portrait of Hitler that hung over the fireplace. He appeared to be presiding over the trial. Lucy recalled the large windows of the courtroom filled with the sunshine from the beautiful day outside, even describing the room as hot, what a luxury, she thought, compared to their cold prison cells. Two large comfortable armchairs in the front row next to each other, what a delight. We are at the show, Lucy remembered with more than a bit of sarcasm. The decor, the actors did not disappoint us. Rather than reading the in indictment or inviting the prosecutor to begin, the chief judge, Oberst Obstrichter Harmsen, began by questioning Lucy and, Sus and Suzanne in German about their responses during their interrogations. Then he asked about some of the evidence he felt had been ignored, peppering the women with a string of additional queries. Any previous convictions, Harmsen asked, have you ever appeared before a court? Never, Suzanne answered in German, speaking for both herself and for Lucy. Harmsen turned the proceedings over to the prosecutor, Lieutenant Lung, so that he could make the formal case against the women. And for the next few hours, he did just that. Lung began by focusing on several of their leaflets and messages to the German troops. One of those was their darkly funny version of a heroic song. The interrogator had asked them about it and Suzanne had not denied that it crudely shamed German women and embarrassed German men. Lung read the song in its entirety to the court. The refrain joked, and when I came home on leave, my wife was pregnant. Don't be cross, my little boy, she said. A fatherland needs soldiers. This is an insult to German womanhood, Harmson declared. One of the other judges, deeply offended, refused to look at Lucy and Suzanne. By no means, Suzanne protested. I've simply tried to show the kind of situation that would arise if a woman actually followed the directives of the party. The men at the table sat silently as Harmson shuffled his papers. Perhaps I should have made it clear that the father of the many children the song went on to mention was always an Aryan, she quipped slyly. Harmson put the leaflet down and picked up another. When it came time to pass sentence, Harmson was blunt. You are franc-tireur, he declared, using the French term for guerrilla fighters or irregular military shooters, even though you used spiritual arms instead of firearms. He gave a brief summary of why their actions were so significant and why he had condemned them as dangerous political criminals. It is indeed a more serious claim. With firearms, note that once what damage has been done, but with spiritual arms, one cannot tell how far reaching it may be. Lucy could not help but think we couldn't have put our defense any better ourselves. Even during prison, I feel, it seems like there's, I don't know, I'm kind of hearing myself. I don't know if we're having a tech issue. Yeah, there, there's a bit of an echo. Uh, your audio is breaking up a bit. Okay. Let me, let me check on my end. Hold on one second. still there yeah we do hear still hear an echo okay i think i wonder if somebody might have unmuted themselves and there's a little bit of a echo coming through so if i could just ask everyone to make sure that you're on mute that might help because i've had this before in other events <laughs> this very same issue is everyone you know what I'll, do? I'll, I'll mute everyone again jeffrey and then you can just go ahead and unmute yourself uh there you go There we go. Try again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. I think that's better. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. It is too. Okay. Thank you. The wonders of Zoom. <laughs> All right. Um, so that was the end of the third excerpt, uh, and I was just going to say that um, that even during their time in prison, the women kept up their efforts at defying the Nazis. Um, they befriended guards. They passed notes. They comforted other prisoners. And the book is full of surprising episodes of what took place in these moments uh, behind bars. German guards, both frightening and humane, prisoners keeping one another's spirits up with singing, Lucy and Suzanne smuggling notes to one another and, and during the night, tales of German deserters being hauled off to their execution, leaving the women to wonder when their turn before the firing squad would come. 
But there's one story in particular that stands out because I think it highlights how important their relationship, their love story was to making all of this happen. As Lucy was being interrogated by the secret police, she made a stunning admission. She blurted out, I am on my father's side of Jewish origin. She admitted to being an unregistered Jew living in Nazi occupied territory, thereby putting herself in grave danger. Then she confessed to the supposed crime, telling her interrogator that she wrote all the notes by herself and that the whole thing was her idea. She was trying to convince her interrogators that she alone had the motive to become the soldier with no name. But in reality, she was not claiming credit for their work as the true mastermind behind the campaign, as some scholars have believed. In fact, Lucy knew just how much of their resistance Suzanne was responsible for. Lucy wrote that it was more often me who accompanied Suzanne, she who took the initiative, which required the most sang froid. Instead, Lucy's calculated risk in admitting her Jewishness was an attempt to, say, to take the fall and to save Suzanne. If the police believed that Lucy alone had a motive to write their notes, then the woman she loved might somehow get off. Lucy and Suzanne survived the war, but they had to work hard to make sense of, of it. What had it all meant? After all, they did not drive the Germans from Jersey with their notes, but in some very important, very personal ways, their effort was a success. And it's something I think that speaks to us today about the power of creativity and imagination and persistence, especially in trying times. I think they've left us with a story about how even small acts of protest and refusal can have significant effects that are hard to see until later. And they remind us why history matters because in the midst of our present day difficulties, a pandemic, deep political polarization, economic uncertainty, we can look back to the stories of people who had it far worse, but still somehow survived. So I wanna close with a final excerpt from the book where I talk about how Lucy and Suzanne tried to make sense of what they had gone through. After the war, one day in saint Helier, Lucy and Suzanne encountered a woman whom they had never met before. She stopped them and proclaimed, I'm so happy to see you alive. Several others also gathered around to greet Lucy and Suzanne. They were in disbelief to learn that the women had survived their ordeal. It must have been a dreadful experience, the woman continued. Now you must forget all about it. Lucy and Suzanne were left dumbfounded by her blithe advice. Later, Lucy sat on her bed, leafing through a stack of papers. Next to her on a small table, table where she placed her tea tray sat the square hat box, one of the German guards had given to her last August as a place to keep her personal items. Other than her memories, the miscellaneous mementos inside this box were all that she had left of their months behind bars. Of all our baggage, she said, the hat box was the only one that had any value. She determined that she would organize all the prison communication, letters, drawings, and notes between her and Suzanne. Few of the documents from their earlier lives had survived the occupation of their home by Germans. She speculated that the soldiers had used them to light fires in the fireplace. Lucy gave some papers to a friend on Jersey and she sent a few other items to friends back in Paris, but the ones with the most personal meaning did not leave that box. The memories were too precious. When Lucy couldn't sleep, she reread the notes Suzanne had written to her during their prison stay, some of them on sanitary napkins and felt strangely nostalgic. But as the days went on, her thoughts began to darken. Lucy had always been the more pessimistic of the two, prone to depression and suicidal feelings and her gloomier meditations in the aftermath of the war echoed that part of her personality. Later, she wrote about how she had become possessed in those days by an overwhelming fear that all her struggles had been for nothing, that there were no greater lessons to learn from all the experiences she had lived through, Suzanne's suicide attempt, their home plundered, illness, death. In the months after the war, they even had to put their beloved cat to sleep. Lucy likened herself in her reminiscences to a repeat offender Lazarus, rising from the dead over and over, only to witness still more suffering. Throughout the years that followed, she wrote about the war in lengthy letters to friends and in early drafts of what might have become a memoir had she lived longer. These writings were not the sort of personal quest for personal identity that she had composed as a young woman in the 1920s and 1930s, but were rather an attempt to make sense of what the war and their time in prison had meant in broader, more universal terms, despite her underlying fear that there was no such meaning to be made but there had been a point behind what they did. Lucy wrote in a 1950 letter, from July, 1940, the invasion of Jersey until May, 1945, the liberation of the Channel Islands. Yes, even in prison, even in secret, 
I wrote to encourage men, including the German soldiers, to liberate themselves. Whether such self-liberation took place was easy to doubt, yet there were occasional glimpses of something that might offer a larger perspective and a sense perhaps of vindication. In January 1946, for example, Suzanne received a letter in German from a POW military hospital. It was from Heinrich Ebers, one of the men who had guarded Lucy and Suzanne in prison. Surely German jailers did not typically write to their former inmates. His family was alive and in good health, he reported, and the British were treating him well. He asked Suzanne to greet Lucy and to write him back. In some strange way, perhaps Heinrich, the German guard, had liberated himself and wanted them to know it. Lucy and Suzanne had liberated themselves through their resistance work too. Lucy in particular had struggled with the question of identity her whole life, from her youth in an assimilated Jewish household during the heat of the Dreyfus affair, to her struggles with her mother's mental illness and her own poor health. Her early writings as Claude Cahan was, were inwardly focused and tortured, an extended attempt to answer the question, who am I? Which neither her book nor her self her evolving self-presentation, her numerous aliases and radical politics could ever seem to resolve. She was always looking for more. Lucy finally found her identity through the soldier with no name, and so did Suzanne. The war was the one moment in their lives when they seemed to have the strongest sense of purpose and the most direct vision about who they wanted to be. Against the Nazis, there was a moral clarity and certainty which their earlier work did not always have. The soldier with no name finally liberated them to speak as loudly and as distinctly as they wanted. Well, thanks very much um, for listening. That's the end of my um, presentation and we'll have a little bit of time for questions um, and conversation. Um, just wanted you to know if you're interested uh, or know somebody else you think might be interested. I have an event coming up later this week um, in Seattle virtually. Uh, of course, and hopefully soon an event coming from the National World War II Museum uh, in New Orleans. I'm also available to speak if any local Alliance Francaise chapters uh, or other groups or book clubs uh, would like to um, have more conversation. I'm happy to join in. I've already done that uh, before, and so I'm happy to, uh, to do that with others. Um, and you can find out more on my website, jeffreyhjackson.com, including a book club kit um, that you can uh, download. And I put covers of all my books up there so that you can see those if you're interested um, and reading anything else. So let me unshare my screen and we can, uh, I'm happy to take some questions and Melissa, I don't know if you or Renee, who's yeah. uh, gonna pose the questions, but I'll, I'll wait for to pose them. And thank you all very much for taking the time to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey. We do have a question from the Alliance Francaise of Cincinnati. If they were arrested in November of 44 and liberated in May of 45, do you know what happened during those six months and how they escaped the firing squad? So um, they were in prison um, and uh, there's a, a whole lot of the book that talks about that experience in prison. Um, I didn't go into it in great detail here today, but um, the, uh, much of the book um, is about that, uh, that time, that experience uh, that they had in prison. So. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> I would encourage to, uh, to, to look at the book themselves. But um, one of the things that I've found in talking to folks about this um, is that it's, there's a lot about this experience, especially the prison experience, that is very unexpected. Um, you know, I think we have a kind of vision of what a Nazi jail looks like from sort of, I sometimes talk about it, sort of the History Channel view uh, of things or the Hollywood uh, vision. Um, and this story will surprise you. Um, in terms of what happens in that, uh, in that prison. Um, they become, I don't wanna say friends with their guards, that's maybe too strong of a term, but they certainly develop a kind of working relationship uh, with the guards. They, um, um, they, they swap stories, they, they, they kind of get to know these, uh, these, pr these prison guards on a very human level. Oh. It's really kind of surprising uh, what ends up happening there. And so, um, and yet at the same time, they live in constant fear. I mean, this, this is not a, a violent story. There's not, there's not uh, you know, scenes where they're beaten in the middle of the night or they're taken out and, you know, the, the kinds of things that we expect, um, you know, the, the sort of violence that, that is there as part of what we think of as a, as a story about World War II. Um, and yet there is very much kind of psychological violence 
Um, they lived every day in prison with the fear, the real fear, that they might be taken out uh, and shot or sent off to a camp, a prison camp um, on the continent. They really didn't know. And they're very clear about expressing that fear um, as, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, in, the, in their writings, they talk about how they live with that every day. So, um, so there's not the kind of, in prison, the kind of physical violence, but there's definitely that kind of, uh, of psychological violence um, that they deal with. Taste, but like I said, there's a there's a lot more <laughs> uh, in the book in terms of the detail of the, the routine of prison life and uh, a lot of the things that they go through. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Craig Bell who asks, were the notes left around really interpreted by the Germans as genuine? Why in their minds would such a, shul such a sh soldier leave such notes in all those places? Um, of course, I don't... I, I, I don't have writings from the Germans saying this is what we thought about these notes, but to me, the best evidence that I have that the Germans took them very seriously is that they collected these notes for four years and that they hunted them down. <laughs> I don't, they would not have done that um, if they didn't take them very seriously. Um, you know, again, just to just to reemphasize this point, I mean, this is a strategically important area for the German military. This this Atlantic Wall. This is supposed to be a. a, a <laughs> a forward defensive um, position uh, to prevent allied assault on the continent. And so um, that, you know, they, they took that very seriously. And Hitler, as I said, was receiving regular updates from the Channel Islands about what was, uh, what was going on. So um, they really wanted to defend that. There were thousands of troops on the island um, over the course of the war, German soldiers. The, the Channel Islands, the only part of British territory that was conquered by the Germans, but they were, I mean, these little islands were filled with German soldiers. Um, so again, it was something that they, they definitely took seriously. The secret field police, you know, rounding people up. And some of the other folks that they met in prison um, were also resistors from the island. There was a local resistance in, Jer in Jersey. It wasn't a sort of organized resistance in the way that we think about the, the French resistance on the continent. Um, it was mostly sort of individuals and groups who were engaged in various acts of sometimes sabotage, sometimes, you know, a whole, a whole range of things, stealing. Um, um, and so many of the people that they met, that Lucy and Suzanne met in prison, were Jersey locals who had been arrested for a, a whole range of things. So the Germans were very, were taking all of this very seriously to make sure that there was no descent in this really crucial space. And so, um, um, as I said, then hunting down the author of these notes um, that they took seriously because it was, you know, they saw it as, a, as a, um, uh, an act of demoralization, right? So it was, it was uh, part of the secret field police's job um, to exactly this sort of thing, to, to find out who was uh, trying to demoralize troops. Uh, Renee asks a question too. She says, though very much a part of the resistance, these two women were very wealthy. Do you think in some respects that their mission was possible because they could? Would it have happened if they were in a different financial or life situation? That's a great question and, and, and hard to know. I mean, they certainly had resources. And as I say, that's part of how they're able to move to Jersey um, in the first place to buy this nice house. Um, I think that you could, you could argue certainly that, that living where they did in this, this sort of big granite, they, they talk about it as a farmhouse, although it's, it's not really, there's not land attached to it. It's not really a farm, but it sort of felt to them, I think like a farmhouse, um, did allow them a certain kind of safety and security because um, even though it was on a main road, it kind of felt like it was a little bit detached. It had sort of walls and plants and trees and things around it. So they kind of felt a little bit sheltered. So I think having that space, that safe space um, that their resources and their wealth had afforded them certainly did make a difference um, because it gave them this home base where they could, uh, could operate from and, and hide out from essentially. Um, but it's so hard to know, you know, um, I, it, I don't have any evidence from any of the sources that they were using their wealth, uh, you know, as part of this effort. Um, I think that a lot of this was, you know, I mean, they were, they were finding pieces of scrap paper. <laughs> uh, and again, of course, this is during a time of rationing, um, but they were finding pieces of scrap paper um, and recycling them or repurposing them for these notes. And some of that was to throw off the Germans, right? To sort of, you know, just find any old piece of paper so that the Germans wouldn't know where it was coming from. 
Um, so in some sense, I think this, you know, it, it was kind of separate from their financial circumstances, but just being able to be in Jersey in the first place certainly was the product of, of their wealth. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Larry Hall asks, did they have any contact with the Free French? They didn't have any contact with anyone else, um, even on Jersey, really. Um, they say in their writings are very clear that uh, only one other person knew what they were doing. It was a friend of theirs that they had met many years before during one of their vacations on Jersey. Um, they didn't involve her in the work, but she knew what was going on. But even their housekeeper didn't know what was going on. So um, part of why they, they do this, and again, I talk about this in the book, because this, is, this comes up in the interrogation that they're having. Um, they say, well, we didn't want to harm anyone else. We didn't want to put anyone else in harm's way. We didn't want to endanger anyone else's lives. Um, and they also say something like, you know, and we're, we're just used to working alone. <laughs> you know, we're there, they were both, Lucy especially was very much a kind of loner. She was much more of an introvert, much, uh, had uh, much more ill at ease with other people. Suzanne was more open and more, uh, um, more extroverted. But um, I think that sort of desire to just sort of keep to themselves, work with one another, that partnership that had been so much a part of their lives for so many decades, um, that was now coming to fruition in this in this work really was just about the two of them working together and i talk about them as a creative pair and so involving anybody else i think would be so would have been excuse me so um just kind of opposite of their of their normal you know work in terms of other you know outside of jersey they really didn't have any contact because it wasn't possible to have any contact um in fact that's one of the reasons that people who talk about resistance on the channel islands um, describe the fact that that on the Channel Islands, there's there's all of the resistance is very local and it's very sort of small group because everybody on the islands knew that there was no possibility to communicate with other resistance groups in France and Britain anywhere else. Um, they were totally cut off, and in fact, the the British government cut the phone lines um, when they abandoned the island. The, the British military cut the phone lines back to Britain. Um, so that the Germans couldn't use them. So they really were cut off. And so they really didn't have any other kind of contact with, with any groups. Sorry, I can't hear you. Are you, are you muted? Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Okay. Annie has three questions. Uh, at what age did they each pass away? What did they do for the rest of their lives? And are they recognized in Jersey for what they did? So, um, <clears throat> so you know, the first question was when they, when did they pass away? Is that right? Um, so Lucy was, I can't remember off the top of my head. She was in her early fifties, I think when she passed away, uh, mid, maybe mid fifties. Um, she had numerous chronic illnesses, um, some of which were sort of exacerbated by the time in prison uh, as, in addition to the stress and just kind of her, her own psychological um, uh, issues. And so she ended up with a, an operable tumor and died. She was, I want to say 56. I can't remember exactly, but something like that. Suzanne lived longer. Suzanne lived into her 70s uh, and into the 1970s. Um, she ended up uh, uh, committing suicide. Uh, she had um, um, appendicitis and she had some other health uh, things. But I think it's hard to know exactly why, but I think a number of things led to that. Um, and she took an overdose, sort of like they had planned to do if they had been caught by the by the uh, the German army. In terms of what they did for the rest of their lives, Suzanne uh, sold the house uh, that they had that they had bought when they first moved and, and where they had orchestrated this resistance from. Moved to another house uh, on the island. I don't know exactly what she did. I know I do know that she continued to take photographs, um, very different photographs from the ones that they had done uh, in their Paris days. They're, they were mostly landscapes. Um, but, um, but, uh, but beyond that, it's hard to know exactly. She didn't leave a lot of documentation about what, uh, what else she had done. And what was the third question? I'm sorry. Were, were they recognized in Jersey for what they did? They, they are now. Um, mm -hmm. it, in Jersey, Jersey has a very, or has had for a, a number of years, a sort of um, strange relationship with its, with its wartime past. For a long time, people in Jersey didn't really want to talk about the war or resistance or the occupation or anything. Um, and in fact, a lot of people, and Lucy and Suzanne were, were part of this too, found out that after the war, people didn't really want to sort of recognize the resistors or didn't want to recognize anybody who had, you know, been involved. They, they just kind of wanted to, to push it aside. 
um, or to talk about the island as a victim, you know, that we were conquered uh, and occupied. So um, it took a while for the people in Jersey to really, and the Channel Islands to really sort of acknowledge the, uh, the, the wartime past and the fullness of that story and the resistance um, uh, story. Um, nowadays, though, they are uh, known on Jersey, the, the Jersey Heritage Trust, which is the local um, historic society and historic preservation, one of the historic preservation societies, um, has done an amazing job of preserving their documents. That's part of where I did some of my research. They've also digitized a lot of that collection. Um, so I was able to work on that, on those documents from a distance. Um, and they have shows and they have stuff on their website. So if you go to Jersey Heritage um, on the internet, you can find things about, uh, about them. Um, and and they, sometimes they have, they'll have museum exhibitions and things uh, of their work. So they are certainly known now um, and other scholars have, have, uh, have written about them as part of the Jersey experience. Um, I'm the only one who's really sort of focused on them, but other scholars have written about them as part of the, the other, um, uh, the effort, resistance efforts on the island. But, but thankfully they are um, getting some of their recognition <laughs> uh, these days. Good. Maureen wonders who reported them to the secret police. She says that someone must have known their work and disliked them for their political views or their social there were a lot of people informing, um, and that's well documented. Um, one of the uh, sources that I used for the research were declassified MI-19 files, so that's British military intelligence files that I went to London um, and looked at. And um, a lot of those were people who had escaped the island and were reporting to British military intelligence. And they were very clear about naming names <laughs> of some of the people who were doing, who were informing local people who were informing to the German secret field police about various kinds of activity that the Germans had deemed illegal, in particular things like listening to an illegal radio um, or other sorts of things. Um, I don't know exactly who informed on them, but it's pretty clear from the sources that we have that somebody did inform. Um, that's what, that, what Suzanne sort of speculates. She also re reports a conversation that she has as she's being arrested. Um, I showed you the photograph of Carl Losa who becomes one of their primary interrogators. Uh, and he essentially says as much to her, that's her, her recollection of this is that, that he says that to them that somebody had, had informed on them. Um, and it seems like, again, from the documents that it was probably the person who sold them those cigarette papers that I started with when they get on the bus, um, uh, somebody who worked at the, at the news agent's um, stand store um, where they had purchased those cigarette papers. It's, I don't have a name, um, but that seems to be the most likely, based on the, the evidence that I have, that seems to be the most likely scenario. And again, it would not be out of character because there were plenty of people who were informing on one another um, during the war. Thank you. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question if anybody else has a question to add into the chat. These are great questions. Thank you all so much for thank you, Jeffrey. These questions. This has been fascinating. Any more questions? Well, well, Jeffrey, it looks like we don't have any more questions. And I, I, I wanted to thank you so much. This book, as I said in the beginning, I've read cover to cover and I really I hope everybody has a chance to, to order the signed copy and um, enjoy this, this story that, that none of us would have known, would, it wouldn't have been told to us. We wouldn't have discovered it without you submitting this incredible idea to, to the, the Federation of des Alliances Francaises. So we are incredibly grateful to you for opening our eyes, for introducing us to these true extraordinary women who did what they could, or their own sort of form of guerrilla warfare to, to change history. Um, it's, it's, again, it's an extraordinary story. And I hope that everyone, the 90 some odd people who participated in this event will take the time to read this, this eye-opening must read. Well, thank you so much. And, and thanks for allowing me to come and talk to everybody. It's, it's a busy time and <laughs> we're all in the middle of so many things. And it's so great to, uh, to meet other people, if only virtually who are interested in learning, learning about history. Um, and just, just thank you all um, so very much for letting me uh, be part of, of this today. I really appreciate it. Well, a great round of applause for you and thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. It was Merci you, you, you're giving us a great gift. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you so much. Au revoir. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée.